Buenas tardes. Eh, empezamos eh, en la sexta sesión de Hot Topics, que como todos saben está eh, pensada para realizarla en inglés, eh, además con eh, la asistencia de eh, personas que no hablan nuestro idioma. Por tanto, eh, continuaremos eh, en este idioma. Eh, good evening, eh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, eh, dear speakers. Uh, this session is uh, the, about uh, hot topics in cardiac pacing. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like uh, first uh, to introduce myself and my co-chairman. Uh, I am uh, Aurelio Quesada from the Hospital General Universitario of Valencia. Uh, and my co-chairman is Oscar Alcalde from the uh, Clinica Universitaria de Navarra. Thank you very much, Dr. Riquio. And we are now with our last speaker. It's Dr. Jürgen Krutkit, and he's going to speak about uh, cardiac contractility modulation. Dr. Casada, Dr. Alcalde, señoras y señores, es una gran alegría para mí de estar aquí porque empecé mi carrera hace 20 años, más o menos muy cerquita de aquí en el Hospital Arisaca en Murcia, después en. Barcelona con Tony Martinez, que, que también está aquí. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's my privilege to speak about cardiac contractility modulation in the next 50 minutes to you. And cardiac contractility modulation, I imagine it's not very popular uh, here in Spain. So, we are doing a lot of cardiac contractility modulation in, um, in Germany. So, I will uh, go through the main topics, uh, we just heard that we would like to move all the stuff out of the heart, to have little spaces, uh, subcutaneous defibrillators and so on, and this is the future. But unfortunately, very often we see X-rays like that, that's full metal jacket, and if a patient comes with infection on Friday afternoon, you know what happens, and very ambitious implanters would say even that's, <coughs> that's not uh, complete because there's uh, no LV lead and there's some nerves and uh, the vagus nerve and um, receptors, uh, baroreceptors, so you can uh, even put more leads and stuff inside uh, this heart. We have one problem, uh, patients with normal cure restoration. So we know that cardiac uh, resynchronization therapy, CRT, doesn't work. So I would like to focus on um, CCM, cardiac contractility modulation, and I will explain you the system, the mechanism of action, very shortly the implant, and the results. So two thirds of our patients have a normal QRS duration, a small QRS complex. So this is a large amount, and this patient we can't address with CRTs, as you know, from the EcoCRT studies. And then the recent guidelines also are very clear. We have a class one indication for patients with a large QRS complex, at least 150, with a left bundle bunch block, with a real left bundle bunch block, and, uh, and sinus rhythm, and ejection fraction below 35%. <coughs> So this is an optimizer system from Impulse Dynamics. Uh, it's not a new system. It's a system the, the company was founded uh, in 96, the first implant we did in 2002. So that's not completely new. It's a pacemaker-like device with two septal leads fixed on the septum, active lead and uh, atrial lead for sensing. Uh, the device is rechargeable, this is a recharger, and the actual version is uh, Optimizer 4. It's not bigger than a normal pacemaker. So how does it work? Uh, it applies a, a very, very high amplitude signal with uh, 50 millivolts by physic and uh, 22 milliseconds. In other words, it's 1,000 volts energy of a normal pacemaker applied in the absolute refractory period of the heart. In other words, inside the QS complex. This was proven to improve contractility. This is a system in situ, two septal leads, uh, atrial lead, uh, concomitant uh, defibrillator, and optimizer 4. Here you see the signals, uh, very large, huge signals inside the QS complex. And uh, this is a mechanism of action. And as you can appreciate in this slide, it's pretty easy. I don't want uh, to speak too, too long about it. Uh, you can spend hours about it. Uh, it's electromagnetic DNA activation. And this um, transfers to phosphorylation of calcium handling proteins, and calcium can enter more easily from the cytosol to the sarcoplasmatic reticulum during diastole and during systole via renodine receptors to the myofilaments. This is a very easy explanation, <coughs> very short explanation, 
but it works with DNA activation and calcium handling proteins. Also, there are more and more indicators that there's one kind of uh, autonomic modulation. They are sympathetic and parasympathetic nerve fibers in the septum, so certainly there's one autonomic modulation component uh, included. As an acute effect uh, during implant, you see already in nearly 100% of the cases an increase in DPDT, this we saw in all our patients, uh, very few cases uh, where it didn't occur. So this is a very normal, normal reaction. This translates during follow-up uh, in the next three months. It doesn't work from one day to the other. It needs uh, two to three months. Uh, this translates to reverse remodeling, proved by ECHO here, by Jack Manu, better ejection fraction, and as the best surrogate parameter for reverse remodeling, um, perhaps, and systolic uh, volumes. This is a case from ischemic heart failure female patient, and I, I, I skip all the patient history because we, we are running a little bit out of time. But she was uh, class three, ejection uh, fraction of 20%, low exercise capacity, high proteins. After six months, you can see even in the x-ray that there's a, a reverse remodeling, ejection fraction nearly double, better exercise capacity, and so on. So this worked perfectly in ischemic heart failure female patient. Clinical trials, we have two trials, the FIX4 and the FIX5 trial, uh, two randomized trials, and in the FIX5 and FIX4 trial with uh, more than 600 patients, there was uh, demonstrated uh, that CCM improves significantly quality of life, exercise capacity, uh, certain LB parameters, and so on. Just one endpoint failed. This was improvement of oxygen uptake in the anaerobic threshold, which, uh, of course, is a very unusual endpoint for heart failure studies. This is our own cohort of patients. Uh, we started, uh, as I said, 2002. Now we have more than 200 patients. These are 80 patients with a long-term follow-up uh, from at least 34 months, and we we were investigating efficacy data and mortality data uh, in comparison to a predictive score. These are baseline parameters, uh, 81 patients, so with a mean age of 61, good medication, most of the patients in class three symptoms, uh, divided in ischemic and uh, non-ischemic heart failure patients, some hypertrophics and so on. <coughs> So long-term efficacy data uh, is looking good. Uh, the ejection fraction uh, raised uh, from 22 to 28 uh, and remained stable over time. Also, uh, the responder rate uh, in terms of uh, at least improvement of one uh, near class uh, was uh, 75%. And uh, this was uh, um, very, very predictive. Um, quality of life was better, minus uh, 20, 20 points uh, nearly in the Minnesota, and BNP decreased uh, by 1,600 points. So this remained stable over time, as I said to you. Which was also very indicating for us that uh, in a normal heart failure population, you see an increase of QRS duration by two to four milliseconds per year in your, in your patients. In, uh, in this heart failure population, the QRS duration remains stable, perhaps as a sign that progression of heart failure can be slowed down or even stopped. To compare mortality, of course, is difficult because it was a retrospective analysis. So we used a, a score, a magic score, which is very uh, good evaluated by 40,000 patients. So uh, using very, very easy baseline parameters and this score indicates you the one year and three years mortality by uh, Integra score. And um, compared to the anticipated mortality data, the, the real mortality in this patient cohort was much better, significantly better. So this perhaps a sign that mortality also can be decreased by cardiac contractility modulation. This, of course, has to be proved in randomized trials. This was a retrospective. There's one certain and one very special subgroup, uh, CRT non-responders. Here you see, uh, you can't see very good, but it uh, was uh, a dilative cardiomyopathy with ejection fraction of 20%, class 3, 4, 
Symptom CQS complex, it was eight, nine years ago, it's 130, so it's not a real left bundle bunch block, but at least the patient has an additional AV block first degree. So we decided at that time, eight years ago, no, we wouldn't uh, decide like that, to implant a, a CRT. It was an uh, easy, easy implant, but patient uh, was a non-responder. So we, we looked carefully for, for some reasons, and the reason was very clear. Uh, he had uh, a typical twiddler. He turns the device around his own axis, but uh, the patient told us that it's not him, that it's his wife who's doing that uh, at night. So we revised everything. This you can see in your Italian restaurant, but you don't like to see it in, in your uh, operation room. We revised the device. Also, you can appreciate that this is much epical, and we would like to have it more basal. And what it worked, uh, no more twiddler. We implanted an additional, because he stayed uh, in class three symptoms, an additional optimizer three at that time. Also, he was a non-responder, and looking to the X-ray again, again a twiddler from the, from the device, everything revised again. And after six months, twiddler from the CCM, again his wife. Uh, after six months, everything stable, so he, improved from ejection fraction from 28 to 40 percent and from class 3 to class 1 and even in the x-ray you can appreciate that there's some kind of reverse remodeling. So <clears throat> this is stimulation from the CRT and because uh, CCM stimulation is intermittent, two hours on, one hour off, you can see the CCM signals. So one lesson we learned from uh, CRT, CCM heart failure, be careful with your wives at night <laughs> if you have a device on, on, on board. Uh, these are the data from FIX12 comparing uh, exactly this subgroup, uh, CRT non-responders. And uh, this will be published in, uh, within the next weeks. Um, exercise capacity, oxygen uh, uptake, quality of life, and LV parameters are significantly better in the subgroup, but of course it's not my favorite subgroup because at least you have six leads, and as we heard before, and it's what, what I think personally, uh, personally as well, we have to bring out all the stuff of that. This is an uh, actual device, Optimizer 4, and this was a prior device which was much, much bigger, but it was pretty wet. So this is an actual device, and uh, it's not bigger than a pacemaker, and uh, the implantation is, is pretty easy. So do we need really three needs? Uh, this is the object of the fixed 18 trial. Uh, the fixed 18 trial just closed. We have the, the final data, and I can tell you already, without telling too much, uh, that we don't need three leads. Uh, we can use just one lead in the, uh, in the septum, and it works equally. One restriction of the CCM system that it just work in sinus rhythms. So this is one uh, major, major issue because most of our patients will uh, experience uh, atrial fibrillation during heart failure progression. So we implanted or, or we over, overcame the, the algorithm implanting an additional CRT device with the atrial lead, we put the sensitivity on four millivolts, so it was blind, uh, it didn't see the atrial fibrillation, and started with atrial stimulation. The optimizer accepted the atrial stimulation from this device as sinus rhythm, and we could apply optimizer or, or CCM signals, although there was atrial fibrillation and, uh, or atrial flutter. So this worked, patient improved, and the next algorithm, which uh, comes up with the next generation uh, next year, will include an algorithm for patients also in atrial fibrillation. We'll have one lead less, so it's uh, much improved. One other thing, and uh, which is very important, we use a lot of subcutaneous defibrillators. It's uh, what I said before. We also in Germany would like <coughs> to have all outside of the heart. So we use a lot of subcutaneous defibrillator. Our uh, implantation rate is about uh, 50 a year. So we would like to combine this with, uh, with the CCM and with other devices, and we were not sure if it's possible because the subcutaneous defibrillator has a surface ECG discrimination. He has intermittent uh, stimulation with very high energy. So we were not sure if this worked together, <clears throat> and we tried it in 15 patients, and uh, it worked. So we had uh, very clear signals. We induced in every case we have and did a lot of crosstalk testing. Uh, there was a shock, and uh, CCM signal application started exactly after a shock 
delivery. So this in 15 patients worked perfectly. This hopefully will be published uh, within the next weeks also. There are some open questions, uh, and one of the most important to get uh, in, uh, implemented to the guidelines uh, is mortality. So there's a fixed uh, five uh, FDA confirmatory uh, trial in US and in some centers in, in uh, Germany and in, in Europe. There are two registry, uh, randomized and uh, US, uh, uh, European registry, uh, comparing also with uh, Seattle Heart Failure Score and MAGIC Score for mortality. So there are the remaining questions hopefully will be answered by, by these uh, new trials. So in conclusion, CCM is an alternative and so far the only uh, option for patients with heart failure, uh, optimal treatment and uh, refractory to uh, treatment. Long-term data is promising. The data from uh, the randomized trials and meta-analysis is promising. There are future changes in the algorithms, so we can use it in patients with IF. Uh, we'll have less leads. Ongoing trials on efficacy and mortality will answer our last questions. And the ideal patient for implant at the moment is a patient with a small QRS complex, either ischemic or not ischemic. Heart failure symptoms class 2 to 3, ejection fraction 24 to 45. If it's too low, it doesn't work. And uh, sign is risen for the future. Also, you can use it in patients with uh, AF. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been a, a long day, but uh, I think the, these four exciting presentations uh, merits the, to, to have a, at least five, ten minutes uh, for discussion and to, to ask some question. Uh, some question from the audience. Okay. While uh, I have... Uh, one question, example for Dr. Kushik. Uh, it's a very, very exciting the, the ability of the cardiac uh, contract lead modulation to improve the, the outcome of the patient, the functional status. A long time ago, we, we worked with the substantial uh, stimuli uh, and we saw that the uh, they have uh, an uh, antiarrhythmic effect when we apply it uh, very near of, uh, of the uh, arrhythmic focus. In your experience, the, the patient with uh, the device has uh, uh, more or less or the same uh, an arrhythmic episodes? And this is a very, very important question. We were looking very carefully for exactly this topic. Uh, for this, in the first years, uh, there was always a concomitant defibrillator implanted because we didn't know if uh, there is a pro uh, effect. So in the randomized trials, as well as in our own experience with 200 patients now, we see that there is a decrease in uh, spontaneous uh, VTVF episodes. Uh, also, uh, there is no change in SVT episodes, uh, although it's, it's not, uh, not, not very clear if uh, the number perhaps is too small, but at least we can say very clear, clearly that there's no probabilistic uh, effect for uh, VTVF episodes spontaneously. Any question for the audience? Okay, I have a question. <laughs> Okay, so we think we are going to conclude our session. It was an amazing session with hot topics in, in new cardiac pacing and new technology. We really thank all the, all the speakers for just to be on time and just for uh, all the experience. And thank you for everybody to be here at the, at the last time of the evening. Thank you very much.